Good morning, everyone. I'm Marty Levin. I'm your current PICPA president. I'd like to welcome everyone to the PICPA's 123rd annual meeting. Of course, this is our first ever virtual meeting. Uh, we had planned on bringing this meeting to our good friends in the Pittsburgh market this year. Um, and a number of you I'd met in Orlando years ago, I promised I would do that. But of course, life threw us a bit of a curveball this year. Um, but we're still pleased to bring this meeting to you virtually. Um, and we certainly hope all of you will join us in a live future annual meeting format. In Pittsburgh, we haven't forgotten about you. We have nearly 250 participants logged on this morning, and I certainly thank each and every one of you for joining us and spending a little bit of part of your day with us on this beautiful day. Please note, technically, while we cannot have several hundred of your mics open at one time this morning, your comments, questions, objections, or any technical concerns that you may have can be shared on the chat box that appears on your screen. Uh, our team is standing by, and if you have any issues, they'll be more than happy to, to help you out this morning. And finally, last but not least, we'd like to sincerely thank our annual meeting sponsor, Gallagher Affinity, for their continued support of PICPA programs. At this time, it is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, U.S. Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick, representative of Pennsylvania's first congressional district that covers all of Bucks and a portion of Montgomery County. Prior to running for Congress, Congressman Fitzpatrick serves as an FBI supervisory special agent. He is a licensed certified public accountant, emergency medical technician, as well as an attorney. Pretty busy guy. We'd certainly like to thank him on behalf of the PICPA for co-sponsoring H.R. 7010, the Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act of 2020, which was just signed into law one week ago today. Among the key provisions in that bill is extending the time allotted for PPP loan recipients to expend the funds that qualify for loan forgiveness from eight to 24 weeks. The law also reduces the threshold for the amount of PPP funds required to be spent on payroll costs that qualify for forgiveness from 75% to 60%, provides for the payroll tax deferral provisions of the CARES Act to extend now to recipients of PPP loans and extends the repayment period for loan balances that are not forgiven on post-June 5th loans from two to five years. Again, thank you, Congressman Fitzpatrick, for all you have done to help our small business clients. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's deeply my honor to present our keynote speaker, the Honorable Brian Fitzpatrick. Good morning, everybody. Uh, sorry, I'm running a little, uh, little behind here. We go from uh, one Zoom call to the next, um, but I just wanted to, uh, to thank you all for your, um, your membership with PICPA. Uh, I am a CPA myself. I, uh, Went to LaSalle, graduated in 96 and practiced for a few years and then went, uh, then went to um, uh, law school and uh, it ultimately led me uh, to a career in the FBI where I spent 14 years prior to uh, running for Congress. And, um, you know, this, is, um, <clears throat> this has been a, a challenging time for a lot of people, particularly uh, those um, uh, in the financial services sector, uh, because you guys have all been uh, providing the input and the guidance to so many small businesses who have been had, having a hard time, small businesses and large alike, uh, who've had a hard time navigating um, this uh, PPP um, uh, protocol and process. Uh, so it's been um, it's been very very challenging uh, for a lot of you. So we want to thank you for the role that you've all played um, in um, in helping uh, businesses navigate, just like. Uh, those of us that are working um, in congressional offices around the country uh, and state legislative offices um, have had a similar role to play in advising uh, people on how to navigate SBA when it comes to the Paycheck Protection Program um, and the disaster relief loans, uh, navigating IRS when it comes to the direct stimulus payments, um, and really all the, uh, the entities that um, were all part of the CARES package. So just to give you um, a little bit of background on um, the stimulus bills that have passed so far, and they're really not, they're called stimulus bills, but they're really not stimulus bills. They were really relief packages. Stimulus is what still uh, remains to come. And um, the first two packages were uh, relatively so small in size. They were under $10 billion, and, and these days that's a small package uh, when it comes to these, um, these relief packages. Uh, the first one dealt mainly uh, with uh, paid family medical leave and sick leave. The second one dealt primarily with testing. <clears throat> the third bill, which was the CARES Act, the multi-trillion dollar bill uh, that you're all familiar with that contained uh, about $300 billion initially in um, Paycheck Protection Program funding. 
So um, forgivable loans for any company under 500 employees after factoring in both the, um, both the full-time equivalent rule uh, and the affiliation rule uh, for uh, franchisees and, and the like. Um, it contained about $300 billion in direct stimulus payment checks. Uh, it had a separate bucket for the bolstering of state unemployment insurance claims, as you all know. So here in Pennsylvania, uh, relatively speaking, um, the, uh, the formula was you're entitled, uh, if laid off, to 50% um, uh, of your salary up to $500 per week. Uh, what the um, Paycheck Protection, I'm sorry, what the CARES Act essentially did for unemployment insurance was add another $600 a week, up to $600 a week on top of that uh, for a designated period of time. Uh, and then there was the direct <clears throat> relief packages for certain industries that were deemed critical uh, to both uh, economic growth and national security. So uh, that was the, uh, the original CARES package. Uh, and then we did an augmentation of an additional uh, $300 billion for the Paycheck Protection Program. And we also needed to set up, uh, I should say Treasury needed to set up some guardrails uh, on that um, program because one of the challenges that a lot of small businesses were encountering was were, uh, they were being put in the back of the line um, uh, for the companies that really needed it. Uh, so it was the mom and pop shop, the owner operated daycare center, uh, the small businesses that really had no access to capital, uh, very limited liquidity, um, who were at the gravest risk of losing employees and shutting down their business, that the paycheck protection program was really designed, um, to, um, uh, to help, uh, not necessarily the larger companies that were only suffering maybe a marginal loss of revenue for a, a short period of time with no intention of laying off their employees. So those guardrails were able to put up, uh, be put up in the second round uh, by the Treasury Department at our request, the request of many members of Congress, um, because really the, the, the key challenge there was that all it required an applicant to do was to certify that they were quote unquote affected, negatively affected by COVID-19. Uh, as that can be broadly defined, uh, and, and uh, there was no um, percentage of loss of revenue that one had to meet. So that all got fixed uh, with the second round, which uh, I can tell you anecdotally just from the work that we do here um, was much more successful, much more on target uh, than the first round. Um, where do we go from here? Um, we've been through several relief packages. What we need now is a stimulus package, a true, a true job creator. Uh, I'm on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Um, we are um, chomping at the bit to get a, uh, a large uh, transportation and infrastructure package through um, because it is a job creator. Uh, it's been something that's been on the agenda for a long time, both in the prior Congress and this Congress, um, and it's a job creator. Um, the, uh, the concept and the, and the desire for um, a, a, a large package is very bipartisan. Uh, both in Congress and in the American public. Uh, everybody knows it's a job creator. Uh, it's an investment, not an expense. Um, and everybody agrees on the definition, both uh, over at infrastructure like roads and schools and bridges uh, and things you cannot see like the IT infrastructure, the electrical grid, subterraneous water piping, and the like. Uh, and also to, to define it broadly geographically to include urban, rural, and suburban. The main debate that's been occurring in Congress um, has been uh, how to fund it. Um, there are a number of proposals out there. Some people have a carbon pricing proposal, some people a user fee uh, uh, at the pump with a gas tax, some people are proposing uh, taxing of, um, of batteries upon installation of electric vehicles since they use the roads uh, as a way to amortize that cost in a similar manner uh, to those um, uh, using um, uh, gas-fueled vehicles. Uh, and then there's some people proposing public-private partnerships. There's a lot of proposals out there uh, I think the one thing that um, makes me more optimistic now on the ability to finance it is the fact that the Fed has lowered interest rates uh, to almost zero, um, which allows essentially interest-free borrowing for a stimulus package that we know we need uh, to jumpstart the economy to sort of reverse the negative impacts of COVID-19. Um, and when we talk about um, our response to COVID, um, obviously, you know, we have a health crisis and an economic crisis simultaneously. Um, I'm a believer that we need to address both. Uh, you can't focus on one and ignore the other. Uh, they are both critical and we have to 
uh, protect both and advance both, both public, public health and economic growth. And what I believe we need to do uh, is to take the same perspective to COVID-19 that we did to 9-11. Uh, and after 9-11, uh, we as a uh, nation said never again, never again would we allow um, a terrorist to infiltrate a cockpit and, and treat a commercial airliner like a guided missile. Uh, and you look at all the steps we took as a country to say never again. We created a brand new agency, the Department of Homeland Security. We fortified cockpits in all commercial airliners. We deployed a federal air marshal program. <clears throat> we deployed sophisticated AT screening devices across all 450 airports in this country. Uh, we created a bipartisan, equally bipartisan commission, the 9-11 commission made up of um, uh, retired, mostly retired <clears throat> uh, national security uh, officials who came up with 41 recommendations for Congress um, on legislative fixes to uh, fix the problem that existed then, which was uh, mostly a lack of communication between the intel agencies and the intelligence community. Um, but we were able to do that, uh, thankfully. Uh, we were able to protect our country from that threat, uh, and it's an ongoing threat, and we need to continue to be vigilant. I think we need to do the same thing for COVID-19, um, and we can. Uh, we need to create a bipartisan commission uh, that, that uh, thoroughly investigates and studies <clears throat> the root of the problem, and I believe there's three legislative fixes needed so that we never have to go through like anything like this ever again. Uh, number one, uh, we need an effective international tripwire system utilizing things like the Sentinel surveillance system. Um, obviously, there was a breakdown in that system, for sure. Uh, the WHO clearly needs to be audited <clears throat> to get to the bottom of what went wrong there. Um, <clears throat> and we need a system that will detect, timely detect, a, any novel outbreak, even in the smallest country on the planet, that would allow other countries to put their guardrails up in whatever means they, they deem necessary, whether it be um, um, uh, uh, cultural and social changes within the country to cutting off or, or uh, restricting trade or travel or whatever it may be. Second is addressing the, um, the supply chain. Um, this uh, COVID crisis brought to light how incredibly dangerous it is when we see manufacturing of anything, but particularly of critical life-saving uh, healthcare necessities, national security type equipment, whether it be N95 masks, respirators, ventilators, caps, gowns, uh, pharmaceuticals, <clears throat> precursor materials of pro uh, pharmaceuticals, or what have you. So um, I think that's really um, going to be important that we provide financial incentives for companies to reconstitute their supply chain back to the United States for these critical um, products. Because uh, if we ever go down this path ever again, for any type of government order shutdown, whether it be for a, a, a bacteria or a virus or, or any kind of pathogen, um, that we are prepared to uh, for domestic production for domestic consumption. Um, that's a huge national security issue. And lastly, is the insurance piece of this. Right after 9-11, um, a lot of insurance companies were denying claims for acts of terrorism, saying they fell outside of uh, business interruption policies or any other policies that the company held. Uh, Congress responded by creating the TRIA program, the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act. Uh, it created a an insurance product that was market priced, risk based, and federally backstopped. Um, we have, when you look at what we just did with the CARES Act and all the others, essentially backstopped, federally backstopped payroll for every uh, small business in this country for a minimal period of two months, which has now been extended. Um, almost every single small business and large business that carry business interruption insurance is now being told that um, pathogens are not covered uh, under BI insurance policies. So uh, one of the things we need to fix, and again, this is going to uh, require um, uh, FASI, a, a subset under the Department of Revenue, uh, which deals with insurance, to study this issue to see if a product can be generated that will ensure businesses from any future event like this ever happening again. Granted, the exposure is much broader. Uh, insurance is predicated on events that are isolated both geographically and temporally in time. Uh, pathogens by their very nature are not uh, on either front. Uh, so clearly the exposure is broader, but as far as I'm concerned and my colleagues on my bipartisan problem solvers, all that does is expand the size of the federal backstop. Um, so I believe, uh, my numbers I believe are accurate that uh, the, uh, the TRIA program uh, says that if there's $200 million or more aggregate losses in the industry, 
um, that a, uh, a federal backstop then kicks in. Um, I believe the original round was a, a roughly $100 billion. Now, clearly with the pathogen, you're talking about much larger numbers. Um, but the important thing is that we have two choices. We either resort, we, we either create an insurance product that we can price appropriately and backstop appropriately, uh, or we're going to resort to endless government bailouts uh, with these one-size-fits-all, blunt force legislative products um, that oftentimes miss the mark, that result in the endless printing of money, um, and uh, all the inflationary concerns that come with that. So th that's sort of the, the, the response that we're looking at uh, with regard to COVID-19. Uh, I don't want to do too much of uh, the talking. I'm happy to answer any questions if you'd like, and uh, I yield back. Thank you so much, Congressman Patrick, uh, certainly for spending all your valuable time with us this morning, uh, for your continued support of our profession, uh, and for sharing your insights with us on uh, current activities in Washington. Uh, we're, we're very pleased and proud to have someone with your, uh, your knowledge and background representing us in Washington. So again, thank you so very much from all of us. Now it's my pleasure to introduce your PICPA Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director, and a, and a man I'm, I'm really honored to call my friend, uh, Mr. Mike Coggan. Thank you, Marty. Uh, pleasure to be here with you this morning. And I am uh, wish we were in Pittsburgh and doing this in person, but we will uh, make the best of this in the format that we have in these challenging times. So uh, I want to start off with just a, a brief video to highlight some of the things that have occurred during the 2019-20 year. So if we can roll that video, please. Holding the CPA license brings so much responsibility. It's welcome responsibility. We are the cornerstone of public trust, okay? They're looking to us. We are the highest level of, of trust of any profession. We need to uphold that. We need to uphold the highest ethical standards. People look to us, they trust us. That is now entrusted to you.
And hello, everyone. I have a quick update for you from the PICPA government relations team in Harrisburg. I want to thank our marketing and communications team for putting together that great summary of uh, this past year. It certainly hit a lot of the highlights that occurred at PICPA. Uh, I wanted to take just a quick moment to also introduce one of our participants today who is online, uh, but with this format un unable to talk to us in person. He will at some point in the future, but Bruce Bain is our liaison to the AICPA board. And Bruce was planning to attend in Pittsburgh today with his uh with his wife and obviously is online now. But Bruce is the uh, Deloitte Professor in Accounting and the Associate Dean of Graduate and Executive Education at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. So uh, Bruce will be, uh, as our liaison with AICPA, popping into Pennsylvania periodically to join us at meetings. So I, I thank Bruce for his uh, commitment to uh, the AICPA and to uh, serving in, in that liaison role for us. Um, you know, these annual meetings are really about celebrating the past and looking forward to the opportunities that we have in the future. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't extend some thanks to some folks who have, uh, you know, helped PICPA be successful as we move throughout this interesting year that we've just gone through. So I'll start with uh, the members, first of all, the 20,000 plus members of the PICPA uh, for their support in helping PICPA be one of the premier business organizations in the Commonwealth. I want to thank our past presidents also for their leadership and guidance provided to the PICPA. We have several past presidents who have joined us today in the meeting, and I would like to acknowledge them. Steve Christian, Lou Elliker, Bob Firely, Jerry McGinnis, Lisa Myers, and Joe Seibert. To our 11 chapters and their leadership, uh, thank you for supporting the engagement strategy at PICPA and providing so many opportunities for members to engage. You are the entry point for many of our volunteers and providing education and networking opportunities is just a great way to get people involved and engaged at PICPA. Certainly our volunteers, both at the state and the chapter level, uh, many of them are attending this meeting today and I, I wanna sincerely thank them for the willingness to give back to the profession and help provide value to our members. Uh, as an organization, we're greatly indebted to our volunteers and without them, there wouldn't be any PICPA. 
Uh, we've gone through a restructuring of the committees at the state level this year and thought leadership groups, and, and it's been off to a pretty successful start. So I want to thank all of them for their uh, ability to uh, adapt to a new model as far as volunteering with PICPA. To our council, you know, for their many hours of discussion and thought leadership and roundtables related to the strategic priorities of the organization, they're really our strategic planning body that uh, helps us to set the path for PICPA. Uh, to our officers and members of the board, you know, for their wisdom and counsel over the uh, over this past year, which will, in the history of PICPA, probably go down as one of our most unique years ever, if not our most unique year ever. Uh, I want to thank Jill Gilbert in her role as president-elect for her perspectives and insight as we tackle these challenges and opportunities. And I certainly look forward to working with Jill during the 2021 year. And finally, um, our leader, Marty Levin. Uh, Marty is one of the most selfless persons I, I've ever met. And he's given so much to the profession as a leader, a leader in his firm, you know, uh, in his public accounting firm in the Lehigh Valley there, a volunteer for the AICPA and NASBA. He's been an adjunct professor for years, helping to fill the accounting pipeline. So impacting uh, candidates and students at, at that level. Uh, he served as a regulator for eight years on the State Board of Accountancy in Pennsylvania, both as a member and as the chairman of that body. And now as the 122nd president of the PICPA, he's worked tirelessly to lead the organization forward. You know, Marty possesses all the qualities of a great leader, uh, clarity, decisiveness, courage, passion, uh, and humility. And all the time, he exhibits an evenness about him and a sense of humor that really helps uh, get things done within the organization. So I really appreciate his style. I've learned a lot from him during this past year uh, and, and over the years as I've had an opportunity to work with Marty in his various roles with PICPA. Uh, I kid Marty that he's going to be remembered when he sits down at past president's meetings in the future as the person who was the leader of the PICPA during the pandemic. And, and that'll certainly be a unique story to tell. And hopefully it will be a unique story to tell. And we won't go through anything like this again. But um, the uniqueness of what we've gone through during this past year, I think, really epitomizes Marty and his skill sets, and it fits Marty. Um, he has the disposition and attitude to make lemonade out of lemons, um, and, he, and he does that better than just about anybody I've ever seen. And I couldn't think of a better person to lead PICPA during these different times that we've been in in this past year. Uh, I look forward to celebrating you know, his success this past year in person at a point when we can do that in the future. Um, and I welcome into that. I welcome him into that exclusive club of past presidents, uh, one of the premier uh, destinations for many of our leaders uh, within PICPA. And last but certainly not least, uh, my team at PICPA. Uh, these individuals are passionate. They're dedicated professionals. They work tirelessly every day to support the PICPA's mission and deliver value to our members. Um, I've been greatly impressed by their resilience during these last several months, especially as we've gone through this time of pandemic, uh, as they've transitioned from a traditional work environment to a work from home environment and continued to, to provide value. Um, finally, you know, I and the PICPA are, are so very fortunate to have a senior leadership team that is unrivaled, I think, in the state CPA society world. Uh, they provide leadership every day that is member driven while considering the possibilities for what PICPA can be in the future and how we can best continue to evolve the organization as we go through these transformational times. Um, I really think that they are helping to drive the success of the accounting profession in Pennsylvania, and I couldn't ask for a better group to go to battle with each day. Um, and I really do appreciate their talents. So I wanted to call those folks out also who are on the call. Uh, Jen Kreider, who is our Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer. Allison Henry, who's our Vice President of Professional and Technical Standards. Lori Braden, who's our Vice President of Marketing and Communications. Adam Batchelor, our Vice President of Learning and Development. Uh, Peter Calcare, who's our Vice President of Government Relations and Advocacy. Um, thank you for all that you do for the members and, and for the profession in Pennsylvania. Uh, and with that, Mr. President, uh, that concludes the report of the CEO and Executive Director. Marty, Chris Pronger here. Congratulations on a successful year as the PICPA president. P-I-C-P-A. That's a mouthful. 
At any rate, <laughs> I understand you've been a tremendous leader. And uh, under your guidance, you have uh, done remarkable work. So uh, congrats to you. Uh, I also understand you're a massive, huge hockey fan. So thank you for your support of our uh, great sport. And uh, listen, your friends at PICPA are uh, very proud and honored of working with you and uh, wanted to wish you all the best as you uh, have your last meeting on June 12th. So uh, best of luck to you and uh, congrats on a successful run as president. Wow, uh, Chris yeah. Pronger, that's uh, that's awesome. We, we, um, we would have we would have had in person, Marty, but we had to we had to settle for the video. But uh, we wanted to have a special guest. Thank you also on behalf of the PICPA. So thank you very much for all your uh, service to the organization and to the profession over this past years, many years. Thanks, Mike. Um, I, honestly, the pleasure has been all mine. Um, my my regret this morning, obviously, is that I. Uh, not having the opportunity to work as closely as we have in the past because uh, truly it's been a labor of love and and the team's amazing and um, it's been great. So th thank you for all you've done for me. Um, at, at this time now, move into some of the more mundane, if we can. Uh, I need to present our, our summary report on the general welfare and condition of the Institute. Uh, our fiscal year recently ended April 30, 2020 with assets of approximately 14 million for our combined group. Of course, the combined group includes the Institute itself, the CPA Foundation, which is our scholarship and, and diversity arm, as you know, and the PICPA Foundation for Education and Research, which is our CPE arm. Liabilities for that combined group, approximately 2.3 million. Of course, that's yielding net assets of approximately 11.7 .7 million. So we've got a very strong balance sheet. We can weather the storm here. Uh, our investment portfolios have a combined fair market value of nearly $12 million at April 30th. Uh, approximately $9 million of that is held in long-term reserve fund for the future of the PICPA, while nearly $3 million of that is held in a fund restricted for the provision of college scholarships to students pursuing the CPA career path in Pennsylvania, our future. Combined revenues for the year ended April 30 were approximately 11.8 million, split approximately 50-50, 4.6 million earned from our membership dues and 4.7 million earned from our CPE programs. Combined expenses for the year approximate 11.4, resulting in a surplus from operations of nearly $400,000. So good year, um, despite everything we've been through, we've still managed to turn uh, an operating profit. I would ask now that uh, we receive the report, make a motion to receive the report of the Institute uh, and approve that by consensus. As a reminder, if you have any comments, objections, uh, or otherwise, you can certainly enter those in the chat box at this time. And again, uh, seeing or, or virtually hearing no objections to that, I would say that the report to the Institute is now accepted by consensus. I've been asked to, uh, to just give a few closing remarks in my year as, as, as president, and I would like to reflect just a, a little bit on where we've been, as Mike indicated, and, and of course, it's so important to see where we're going. There were really, uh, again, it's been an unusual year to say the least. I don't have to tell everyone out there. Uh, I certainly could have predicted when I took over as president one year ago today uh, how this year was going to turn out. It, it's not how any of us saw that. But it's been a year of hard work, uh, a year of commitment, and honestly, a year that I have enjoyed so thoroughly, and I am so proud of how our team rose to these challenges that, that were thrust upon all of us. Uh, it's been amazing. There were really four cornerstones that I established as goals when I took over as president. Um, the first of those was so important to improve the value proposition to our membership. Um, during this year, we shifted our focus and resources really from consumer content to member content. You know, our resources here at PICPA are precious, uh, and we've recommitted those resources to our members first and foremost. We're, we want to serve you. We supported member engagement this year by eliminating underattended conferences and other underperforming programs to create new events that provide for better member engagement. And we now offer new CPE products that members have told us that they are seeking. We've shifted seminars to local clustered formats, relying more upon our own subject matter experts in-house and less upon third-party, more generic providers. 
We're looking at the national learning and development landscape and for potential opportunities for future growth and exciting development and identified some unique opportunities that I think you'll, you'll find coming forward. Uh, we've developed a new platform for simulcasting and a new evaluation process to use data to drive decisions about our future program development. We've provided additional free content to our members. As Mike indicated, we've converted the thought leadership groups from previous conference planning committees in order to drive more timely and relevant content for members rather than simply repeating prior year conference agendas, not the same as last year anymore. And of course, we responded to the COVID-19 crisis rapidly as a team to, develop, to deliver timely content and resources of value to our members. We met with leadership from the Department of Revenue during this time period and broadcast the program online to over 1,800 PICPA members. Similarly, we more recently met with leadership from labor and industry during the crisis and broadcast that online to over 550 members. Our leadership met with 24 of the G400 firms, each of the big four firms, and was able to visit 10 of 11 chapters. One of you, uh, there were some, some uh, limitations there we, were, we had to cancel, but unfortunately, we were able to meet with so many members to listen to your concerns to make the PICPA a future that you want. We employed Facebook Live to broadcast the annual meeting and leadership conference to hundreds of members. We developed, we developed small firm focus groups, which provide an opportunity for over 50 firms meeting in four locations to exchange thoughts about issues and concerns that directly impact our smaller practice units. We provided online as well as in-person professional issue updates to over 700 members. And from May to January this year, our 11 chapters hosted 140 events affecting nearly 5,000 members. The second cornerstone was we were attempting to drive more students to careers as CPAs to address the pipeline issue. Our CPA Foundation increased our career day programs. We created three new webinars for students, grads, and donors, and we increased our volume, our involvement with NABA. We visited six colleges and universities. Mike and I had the pleasure of traveling all over together, and we spoke with students and faculty and accounting society members. We provided successful candidate dinners and lunch programs across the state where we met the newest CPAs and, and certainly uh, it was enjoyable to meet their proud family members, it certainly took me back. And we promoted the, C, the CPA Foundation through online outreach and firm visits and generated over $200,000 in donations to be used for scholarships and diversity programs. Thank you for all who have contributed to that. Our third cornerstone was to continue to engage our corporate finance members and extend PICPA's value beyond serving those simply in the public accounting industry. Nearly 50% of our, our membership are members outside of public accounting, and we need to recognize those folks. We attended a number of corporate outreach programs during the year. We created a new CFO and controllers conference to suit the needs of those in industry. And we created and continue to create new CPE content directed at members in industry. And last but not least, of course, the cornerstone was our advocacy efforts under the direction of Pete Calcara. We raised over $200,000 for our political action uh, committee, our PAC committee, and published the first annual CPA PAC report. We secured two pieces of legislation, Act 90, a 10-year statute for collections, and Act 13, allowing for combined PA 41 return filing. We're currently working on an update to the CPA statute in HB 2288, which will allow Pennsylvania CPAs to stay in step with some of the more national trends. We're working with legislators, the AICPA leadership, and we've authored letters to the governor during the time of this pandemic crisis to address loan forgiveness issues and those types of questions that have come up amongst our practitioners in Pennsylvania. We continue to be involved with AICPA leadership to keep our finger on the pulse of legislative activities in Washington that impact our clients and our profession. I'm really proud of what we've accomplished this year, but there's still some more to go. Where's the future in all of this? I think despite the recent impact of the, and, and the negative impact, both economic and health-wise, uh, the current pandemic crisis has afforded us new ways of working together. And I think that's gonna help us become a more efficient organization for the future. Crisis is fueling innovation. Today is a, is a prime example of that. We're having regular online video meetings. They're helping us to collaborate more timely and effectively. Remotely working and telecommuting is helping us to become more efficient and meet the needs of our younger, more technical members of our profession who enjoy working in that, that area. 
Reductions in the overall real estate footprints may allow valuable resources to be redirected to other areas, such as staff development and helping improve that pipeline. And finally, we are learning new means of remotely servicing clients and company needs. Some fascinating stories are starting to come out about the accomplishments that are being made by using online technologies. Your PICPA team has remained fully engaged during the pandemic crisis. Our 50 plus team members have remained available and they have been working every day to provide uninterrupted services to our members and keep us apprised of the changes that impact us all. And I thank them all. We're fortunate to have such an experienced group of these folks at the PICPA, as well as an extraordinary talented group of people. We are in such good hands in the future of this organization as we all now face the new normal. In closing, I'd like to personally thank the PICP, PICPA team for their support and certainly their friendship and that do whatever it takes attitude that, that simply amazes me. I could not have fulfilled my responsibilities as president without this amazing team. Specifically, Mike, uh, Jen Kreider, Adam Batchelor, our director of L&D, amazing young guy and a tremendous Flyers fan. Lori Braden, Peacock Hara, who uh, there's no one in Harrisburg who doesn't know Peter. Allison Henry, Meg Killian, and really everyone at the PICPA who works so very hard every day to promote our profession. There are too many of you to name, uh, but rest assured, I I'm thinking of all of you today and I thank you for everything you have done. A big thank you goes out to our immediate past president, Steve Christian, uh, in addition to becoming a really good friend and, and uh, he has been my sounding board and has always been my voice of reason. Um, Steve, thanks so much for all you do for me and, and for your friendship and I look forward to continuing that friendship. I'd also like to thank and congratulate your incoming leader, Jill Gilbert, who has been there to support our efforts all year long. She's gonna be an amazing leader for the Institute for this year ahead. Um, I ask all of you to please continue to support our efforts as you have done mine throughout the year. I wish her and her team and the entire slate of incoming officers, board, council, and committee members a rewarding, successful career. And I know you'll continue to achieve so many wonderful things for our Institute. This past year has been filled with um, hard work and it's been a time commitment but it's been so satisfying and has been one of the huge true highlights of my professional career. I wanna thank all of you for allowing me the opportunity to be a leader. Uh, the year has not been without its challenges, certainly. Um, we've learned firsthand how very important we are to our clients and the companies we serve. This has been a stark reminder of the good work that we all do and all the good work yet to be done. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you all so very, very much for being there. I'd also like to thank the outgoing board and council members at this time. Uh, you contributed so much to our efforts and, and it was very helpful to, to have you on board and I enjoyed collaborating with all of you, specifically board members Jess Chen, Dave Manbeck, and Corey Yang. Of course, Steve Christian, not to be forgotten as immediate past president. I know you're also an expiring board member and, and thank you again. Our expiring council members, uh, Mike Cade, Michael DiStefano, Melissa Gamelli, Judith Heron, Marty McCarthy, Ian McDowell, and Wendy Newcomer. And our expiring PACPA Foundation board member terms, Ron Simonic. Ron, thanks, so I know how hard you've worked for the foundation. Jason Skrinak and Sam Stevenson, my friend from the State Board of Accountancy. All of you, thank you so much for making the CPA Foundation such a success. And our expiring AICPA council member terms, Mitch McKenney, and former PICPA President Lisa Myers. We'll miss you at, at AICPA council meetings, whether virtually or in person. Also a big thank you for all of those outgoing chapter presidents for their service. Um, you know, we couldn't do what we do without the chapter leadership and we thank you for all you do. And we hope that you'll continue on your path, uh, perhaps at the state level. At this time, I would like to introduce Ryan Brocious, who is chair of our nominations committee and he will read the nominations report for the upcoming 20 21 PICPA year, Ryan. Hey, hey, Marty, right before we go to uh, Ryan, I wanted to come back on for a second because uh, in my old brain, I forgot to mention one of my team members who is critical to the success of PICPA, and, and that's Meg Killian. And in my head, I was going around the office from the right side of my office around, and Meg's the only person in the office that sits to my left. So uh, I, I left her out, but I wanted to 
obviously express my thanks to Meg too. She's she does a, a great job leading our member relations, but also our PACPA Foundation, and and is the person that's responsible for putting these annual meetings together. So thank you, Meg, and sorry for missing you that first time around. Ryan. Ryan. Mr. Chair of the 2019-2020 Nominations Committee and a past president PICPA Erie Chapter. The Nominations Committee met on January 13, 2020 in accordance with Article 6, Section 4 of the PICPA Bylaws. And I am pleased to present the following slate of candidates. President, Jill Gilbert. President-elect, Frankie Aitken. Vice Presidents, Cynthia Bergvall and Heather Demshock. Treasurer, Aaron Risden. The new members of the Board of Directors serving a two-year term from 2020 to 2022 are Corey Ng and Shay Saman and Chris Turtle. New council members serving a two-year term from 2020 to 2022 are Arthur Ayers, Mark Balistreri, Tom Barnes, Nicole Buckman, Jessica Hildebrand, Stephanie Hollick, and, Bri and Brianna Liberoni. New to the Committee on Professional Ethics, serving a three-year term from 2020 to 2023, are Roxanne McMurtry, Jonathan Nichols, Krista Showers, David Torillo, and Michael Winner. Article 5 of the PICPA bylaws states that the nominations committee shall consist of 11 active members, with three being elected each year for a three-year term. In addition, two members will be the two most recent immediate past presidents, who are Marty Levin and Steve Christian. Members of the committee are nominated by the board and elected by the members in accordance with Article 9 of the PICPA bylaws. Jeremy Sacito was designated by Chair Marty Levin. Those nominated for a three-year term from 2020 to 2023 are Lynn Swain, Michelle Ward, and Joseph Zavko. AICPA Council nominations are subject to election by AICPA Council. The nominees for the three-year term beginning May 2021 are Jill Gilbert and Matt Mallinson. Other members serving in leadership roles include the Pennsylvania CPA Foundation board members. The following individuals were elected by the PICPA board at the April 23, 2020 meeting to serve a two-year term from 2020 to, 22, 2020 to 2022. Michael DeStefano, Jeffrey Herr, and Barry Williams. This concludes the report of the Nominations Committee. Thank you. Great, thank you. Now the PICPA bylaws provide that nominees for the various offices presented by the Nominations Committee shall be declared elected by the Secretary by casting a single ballot. I would like to move now that we've received the report of the nominations committee and approve the single ballot by consensus. Again, if there's a reminder, if you have comments or objections or, or comments at, or, or thoughts at this point, you can certainly share those in the chat room. Uh, but of course, hopefully seeing no objections and virtually hearing none, I would ex move to accept that report by consensus. I will now administer the oath of office for the nominees. Um, I know you're out there in cyberspace, but uh, please raise your right hand in front of your video screen, if you will, and, uh, and repeat after me. I solemnly promise to support the Charter and Bylaws of the Pennsylvania Institute of Certified Public Accountants and will discharge the duties of this office with fidelity. Congratulations to all of you. You can put your hand down now. And it's now my esteemed pleasure to introduce the amazing new president for 2021 for your PICPA, Ms. Jill Gilbert. Congratulations, Jill. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Marty. I just wanna take this time uh, to recognize you for your outstanding leadership over the past year um, and throughout your professional career, everything that you have done uh, with the PICPA. Um, as I mentioned, you've been a huge mentor to me 
Um, and I look forward to um, walking in your footsteps and I'm sure I'll be asking you uh, many questions along the way. I really wish we could all be together um, in Pittsburgh, um, certainly Marty, to celebrate uh, your success. Um, hopefully you enjoyed the cameo by Chris Pronger uh, as your consolation prize. I would like to raise a glass, my PICPA Yeti to you, um, as a virtual toast uh, to, to your success. Um, I wish you nothing uh, but the best. And rest assured, Marty, uh, next time we're together, um, I'll offer you a proper toast. Congratulations, Marty, and thank you. To our new board members, congratulations to our new board and council leadership. I look forward to working with you over the next year, and I thank you for your willingness and time to serve. I really hope that you find your experience as rewarding as I have. Thank you to all of you for attending this annual meeting. I am amazed that we have over 250 persons attending this meeting. Marty, you got the record. Most attendees at an annual meeting. So that, that's, that's fabulous. As I was looking through uh, the list of attendees, I noticed several familiar faces. Some who I met in my infant years, if you may, with the PICPA through chapter leadership up to statewide committees, PICPA board members, and finally co-workers of the past and present. Many of you have mentored me along the way and I really appreciate that. There's also many of you in attendance that I have not had the pleasure of meeting and I am hopeful that we will be able to meet face to face in the coming months. I had the honor of attending a past president's dinner last year. And as I sat in the room and looked around, I was overwhelmed by the amount of knowledge that was present among that group. I know Mike had mentioned earlier that there are several of you past presidents uh, that are on this uh, call for the annual meeting. And I would also like to take the time to thank you for your past leadership and more importantly, for forging the way for the next generation of PICPA leaders. Thank you again for your leadership and continuing support. It is such an honor to serve as the president of the PICPA and it's over 20,000 members. The actions of the PICPA during this pandemic have been very proactive. Even before it became evident that we would not be able to hold our usual live chapter annual meetings and this PICPA annual meeting, the team at the PICPA acted quick, quickly and thoughtfully in developing alternate plans. Instead of having our usual live annual uh, chapter meetings, we had one virtual meeting with all chapters together. The meeting was very well attended and I think very um, important for everyone from across the state to be together. However, there is no substitute for engaging with members in person. I was very much looking forward to meeting with members across the state at those chapter meetings. And Marty and Steve Christian, I know you both were looking forward to that as well. Uh, Marty, want to give you an open invitation. Please feel free to attend any of those live chapter meetings with me in the coming year. My main goal for the next year centers around membership. Certainly, we are a membership organization, and it is crucial for, our, for us to continue to be successful that we not only obtain new members, but we, we retain these members. In order for us to accomplish this goal, it is necessary for us to both increase the talent pipeline and also increase the PICPA member engagement. 
as I said, increasing the number of members is crucial to our continued access. Many of you on the, at this meeting have been members for several years, and I thank you for that. You obviously find great value in the membership. But let's face it, we're not getting any younger. The average age of our membership is 51. Therefore, obtaining and retaining younger members is essential to our continued success. We must continue to engage with prospective accounting students well before college. Contributions to the Pennsylvania CPA Foundation is just one way that those of you in attendance in this meeting can make an impactful change to the future of our profession. The CPA Foundation reaches students early and often through a variety of programs and makes these students aware of the potential that an accounting career holds. I have and will continue to sing the praises of the accounting profession to anyone that I meet. I encourage all of you to do the same. Go back to your respective firms, businesses, friends, family. Encourage them to enter the accounting profession. We are much more than number crunching, pocket protector wearing folks. Just as we tell our clients they need a secession plan, we as CPAs need to build a pipeline of accountants who will carry our profession into the future. Accounting professionals were deemed to be life-sustaining businesses by Pennsylvania Governor Wolf during this pandemic. I would joke with my family each time I would head to my home office that they were not to bother me as I was busy saving lives. All joking aside, while we are not saving lives, it has become evident in the last, last months how essential the accounting profession really is. From guiding our clients through the PPP application and forgiveness calculation, to just being an ear to listen and provide reassurance has been so rewarding. Yes, we still do crunch numbers. And yes, some still do wear pocket protectors, but we truly are a trusted advisor to so many. Retaining our membership is also essential to our continued success. Active engagement in the PICPA has a strong correlation to member retention. Attending and engaging in PICPA sponsored educational programs is just one of the many ways that members can become engaged. I realize that not that many people do not aspire to hold leadership roles such as board members or council members. However, there are many other ways to become engaged. Attending chapter events, chapter leadership positions, statewide committees, contributions to blogs and articles, and the list goes on and on. I know I am preaching to the choir, as many of you hearing this are highly engaged members. I challenge you again, go back to your colleagues, go back to firms, businesses, friends, family, and speak to them about the PICPA. Encourage them to become more engaged. If everyone on this call can get just one member or one person to become a little more engaged, that will have an impactful and profound effect on our membership. In closing, I encourage all of you to reach out to me. Let me know your thoughts, suggestions, and my hope that is in, in the next year, I will be able to see many of you face to face and in person. I would like to thank all of you for taking time out of your day to attend this 123rd annual meeting of the PICPA. Thank you also for your continued support 
of the PICPA and the Pennsylvania CPA Foundation. Stay safe and be well. Thank you.